I don't know what it's like across the country, but definitely here in California, there's just not a big supply of CPAs. Really? And so what's happening is there's, there's such a high demand. And what people are looking for is tax planning as well. There's a lot of firms out there that they just don't have the time. And so it's, give me your information. I'm going to pump out your tax return, move to the next client. Welcome Model FA's David DeSalle here, CEO of Model FA and your host of the Model FA podcast. And I am very excited to bring today's guest to all of you, Trevor Scotto. Trevor is not only a friend of mine, but also a client of mine. And he has a pretty cool story. I know a lot of folks in the industry have toyed with the idea of merging your practice with a tax practice. Uh, some of you have done that, and perhaps it hasn't gone as well as you had hoped for. Uh, but Trevor and his team uh, came together back when they had about 150, 160 million in assets under management. And you fast forward to now, they have over 500 million in AUM. So we're going to pick his brain on uh, his journey, how he got into the industry, as well as how they actually executed this deal and converted a lot of those tax clients. So Trevor, is, he's the co-founder of Fiduciary Financial Group. Uh, but with that, Trevor, welcome to the show, dude. Hey, David. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. So I guess um, just to help set the stage before we get into uh, the meat of the content, um, tell us about your backstory. Did you go from college right into financial services where there are some steps in between um did you start your business you know fresh or did you start a company first i guess help us just understand your journey uh and how you got started awesome yeah great question um so i studied accounting in college and so i actually uh, did accounting right after graduation got my cpa uh did some tax returns and then um, obviously the grind of the the, the tax world um, was a bit interesting to learn about and an experience, of course. I learned a ton, fantastic experience. Um, I have a twin brother who was actually working at LinkedIn at the time, and they had a family day, and they had literally rented out an entire theme park uh, just for the employees and their family members. And so that got me excited about, well, maybe there's a, some role in finance that I can do for in tech. So I had a quick stint at a company called Glassdoor. That was a phenomenal experience as well. When I joined, I was the third finance, one of three in the finance team. And when I left, there was about 20. Um, and the main reason that I left was my dad was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is a pretty aggressive blood cancer. And so the unfortunate thing was, you know, he worked really hard. He taught me a lot about money and how to save and, and, and have good money habits. Um, so he worked really hard about 42 years, retired and then six months into his retirement. That's when he was diagnosed. And so it kind of changed our world completely started the chemo. Um, thankfully he's still with us, but, um, I did some soul searching at the time. Uh, and it's just like, what do I want to do with my life? And I knew I wanted to, to help people. Uh, not necessarily just work for a corporation the rest of my life, but maybe work for, for people, work for myself. And so I had a, a buddy of mine that I played football with at Marine Catholic, and um, he launched his own little firm, about $28 million. And so uh, I took the leap of faith. I joined up with him. We were at a smaller RIA and then uh, quickly realized we wanted to do our own thing. So we left, started Fiduciary Financial Group in December of 2016. Um, and that's how I got into wealth management. Well, you gave me chills when you talked about your father, and then you uh, gave me a sigh of relief when you said that he's still with you guys. So thanks for uh, continuing along that story. Of course. Um, it's, yeah. and it has a, a good ending uh, or a good continuance, I should mm -hmm. say, uh, still going. Um, I, I want to hit on that if you're uh, okay with that and, and kind of get a little bit uh, deeper, if you will, on, you mentioned that it changed your, your outlook and your perspective, um, of like what you should be doing for work, right? He worked for 42 years and then six months into retirement was diagnosed and it kind of 
you know, you look at the past 42 years and it's like, damn, did I do everything that I wanted to do or are all mm -hmm. my blood, sweat and tears at the company that I worked with? Um, so I guess from a perspective standpoint, like how did that shift? Did it shift like your values and the things that were important to you or I guess help us understand that? Yeah, it was um, obviously uh, my dad is the world to me, um, still is. Uh, thankfully, he's still around. But you know, at the time, it was you know, you, obviously, what you shouldn't do is go online and so you quickly look online, and it's you know, people that get diagnosed, it's average lifespan is two to five years after diagnosis. Um, he's beating those odds, thankful, thankfully. But at the time, it was holy cow, uh, my world can change. And then similarly, it was, well, what if I just work and grind, you know, 40, 60, 70 hours a week for 42 years, and then the same thing happens to me. To your point, it's, you know, is there something else that I really want to at least go for or try um, so that I didn't have any regrets? So then, uh, and I'm smirking as I say this for uh, for those of you who are just listening to the audio, but it's interesting because I, I always say to myself, I, I'd rather, I'd rather work a hundred hours a week for myself than 40 mm -hmm. hours a week for someone else. So I'd be shocked if you're not grinding still, um, it mm -hmm. probably just feels different uh, because it is your own thing. But what does that look like in terms of, uh, are you working and I'd be shocked if you're actually tracking your hours, but are you working 40, 50, 60 hours a week and, and still grinding? Or do you take more time off or do you kind of, you know, plan out time away from the office to make sure you're still living your life? Like how do you balance or, or blend the personal and professional sides of your life? Yeah. So that's a good point. And I, I should clarify <laughs> it's, uh, you know, working 40, 50, 60 hours for somebody else. Uh, versus for myself. And I would agree completely different feelings um, when you're working for yourself. It's a different type of stress, but I'd, I mean, today where we are just, the stress is uh, a fraction of what it used to be when I had a boss and, you know, working for a corporation, things like that. And so <clears throat> um, I'm blessed. And I think a lot of folks that listen to this podcast that are in the wealth management space uh, would probably feel the same where, you know, this is a, an incredible career path. Uh, to really help people. And so a lot of times it, it doesn't feel like work. And, but what I mean by that is just, there's zero stress in a lot of what I do. Um, and I love what I do. Um, so to your point, you know, I always kind of say, even at this point, I'm still kind of always on, but you know, it's enjoyable. Um, I'm probably putting in 50 hours a week, I'd say. So nothing crazy. Uh, the big difference of course is, you know, I can say no, I can choose what I want to work on and flexibility. That's probably mm -hmm. the biggest thing. Uh, the balancing act between, you know, <laughs> work-life balance, I have two li little ones, four and three. Um, so it's, it's, I'm still working on the balance thing because <laughs> it, because it's all important, of course. Um, but yeah, work in progress, if you will. Gotcha. Excellent. So you and, and your, this was a, a buddy of yours, uh, from college, I think you from said high, or school. high school from high school, from high school and you played yeah. football together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And you're still together now. Still together. Yeah. Awesome. So you guys, you know, were working together at, you know, an RIA and then you left started a uh, fiduciary financial group. And at that point in time, that was 2016 or am I misremembering the time frame? No, that's correct. Okay. So, so when you guys left the RIA, did you, in 2016 merge with a tax practice or did that come later? I'm just trying to get a sense of the actual sure. timeline. Yeah. So, um, 2016 was the big year. So 2016 was the year I, you know, joined my buddy. We were at the other RA. It was a four month stint. And then at the end of that 2016 is when we left, launched our own firm and the clients came with us. Uh, we actually merged with the tax firm in 2020. So during COVID, is when the official merger was completed. Okay, cool. So when you left the, and I don't need exact numbers, but ballparks, but when you left the RIA, started Fiduciary Financial Group in 2016, at the, the day of incep inception, when all the clients came over, um, what was your AUM at that point? Um, at that point, we were probably only about 30 million. 
Okay. And then you fast forward four years to 2020 before the merger. Pre-merger, we were about 65 million. 65. Okay. So I had the numbers a little bit off on, on my end. So 65 million. Um, and I guess what were a couple of the main ways you got from 30, the 60 or so from a business development standpoint, were you guys doing workshops or getting client referrals or how, how was that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. So this was pre COVID. So, uh, literally no zoom, um, <laughs> and it was pounding pavement, uh, a lot of networking. Um, and I think what really helped us, cause we were, I mean, at the time, I think we were under 30. Uh, and so, um, you know, you know, if you're, you have a $5 million portfolio, you're going to trust two knuckleheads that are under 30 <laughs> with your finances. <laughs> and so what helped me and my partner, my partner also had Richard, uh, he also had his CPA and certified financial planning designation. And so without those credentials, I don't think we would have grown that much. And so that kind of helped with the credibility. We were both CPAs, CFPs. So that helped, but it was a lot of, you know, uh, like I mentioned, pounding pavement, shaking hands, uh, calls, um, networking meetings, and just grinding. And and that was, yeah, lots of work. I just remember <laughs> work was always on my mind. And what sort of spawned the idea of merging with a tax practice in the first place? Like, did you seek out wanting to do that or did it come about th through networking? You met mm -hmm. these folks. Help me understand that. Sure. So because I didn't have any experience in the space, one thing I did early on was like, well, what do other successful firms in the space do? And how are they growing? All right. So I just remember specifically, and you know, at the time we shared an office with a another CPA who was actually doing tax work. And so obviously there's just a lot of cross-pollination between tax and financial planning, wealth management. Um, so we were always just talking shop, talking ideas, um, brainstorming, if you will, on on client situations to add more value. But there I won't forget there was a um an accounting journal that came out one summer and it came across, it would basically list the top 50 asset managers that were also CPAs and did tax work in the country. And so I just <laughs> called the top 10 um, on the list to multi-billion dollar firms. Um, crazily enough, I thought I was going to get zero responses. And I was actually able to talk to four CEOs from the top 10, which was no fantastic. And so what was huge was, you know, they gave me really good insight and it just kind of a light, light, um, light bulb switched on, which was, okay, we have to do this. Um, because the messaging was clear is it's just another way you can add a lot of value, but also differentiate yourself from, from your peers. So and because we go ahead, no, nope, finish your thought. And because we were CPAs, it was kind of, um, you know, we already had that for us. It's not like we had to go get tax experience and do that. So it was just, um, yeah, it just made a lot of sense. So I feel like there's a, and we're going to go through like, okay, then what happened, then what happened, then what happened. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, when you reached out to these firms, these CEOs, I think there's advisors and just people in general out there that would love to have the audacity and the courage to do the same thing, to level up their network, gain insight. But one of the things that I think would cause me pause personally is, well, I, what if I don't have anything to offer them? I'm purely just asking for their time. Um, how did you position those outreaches on your end that you think helped in convincing four of those folks to actually hop on the phone with you? Because rightfully so, I think you would agree that they're way out of your league, so to speak. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, absolutely. You, know, if you can rack your brain to how you position that outreach. I think that would be helpful for some of the folks listening that whether it's to a firm like this or anything else, just help them get out of their comfort zone um, and see what's possible. And I'm sure it's fairly simple the way you did it, but still, mm -hmm. how'd you go about that? Yeah. Um, if I, I'm trying to recall, is it quite, quite a while back? Um, but I, I believe it was more along the lines of just being 
totally honest and transparent of what, where I'm, where I'm at and where we're at and some thoughts and just wanting to get their ideas and um, if they're willing to, to just chat with us and also being selective on you know, everyone I talked to, nobody was in the state of California. Uh, so these are folks that were sprinkled across the U S and we're, we're located primarily in the, in the San Francisco Bay area with an office in Idaho as well. But these are folks out of different States. And so I think there was just, there was no, um, to your point, we wouldn't really be caught crossing paths with any mm -hmm. of their clients or prospective clients. And so I think that was probably easier, um, that for them to sense. just say, Hey, let's hop on a quick 30 minute call. Uh, actually that's, that's also what I did was just like, Hey, do you have 10 minutes for me to pick your brain on what this looks like and, and, you know, what you've learned from it? Understood. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is just putting yourself out there, being vulnerable, being transparent, being brief and being mindful of the fact that they're not your next door neighbors where they're going to give you the answers to allow you to step on their toes. Um, mm -hmm. if I'm hearing that correctly. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. So you get on these calls, you get some insight, you're sold for lack of a better way to put it. We got to do mm -hmm. this. How do you start searching for a tax practice to merge with? First action item we had was finding a seasoned tax professional to add to our team. Uh, so Richard and I both started pinging colleagues that we've known for a while, whether it was email or LinkedIn. Um, and there was actually one colleague I had in particular that I was very intentional about reaching out to, and that was Shane Cooper, who's now one of our partners. Uh, what was awesome about Shane is that him and I actually went to college together. We were in the, some of the same accounting and tax classes. And of course, he you know was one of those students that aced all the exams and all the teachers loved him. Um, and not only was he obviously super intelligent, but super easy going, very easy to talk to. Uh, you know, he graduated, went on to get a CPA and master's in tax. So obviously somebody I wanted to, to get on the team. Um, and when we did reach out is shortly after the April 15th deadline. So thankfully he was in the position to make that change from his current role. Uh, he came on as our, our first tax partner, if you will. Um, and he's been an absolute godsend for us. And so, um, once he was on board, we were looking to take over an existing tax practice to really jumpstart our growth. We created a, a, a letter that we eventually mailed out, but we probably gathered about, I don't know, 200 lists, 200 names of CPAs. <laughs> and we mailed out a couple of newsletters or um, not newsletters, but pamphlets, if you will, of like, Hey, we're, you know, here's who we are. And we're looking to, to partner with a tax firm. Um, please reach out if you're interested type of thing. And so after a while, we finally got, you know, we talked to a couple of folks, um, and then, um, yeah, we, our, our current partner, Tom, he's the one that re he reached out and just said, you know, Hey, we're, we're, <laughs> do you guys have time to chat? Um, interestingly enough, he also went to the same high school as us, but different years. Um, and he was managing about a hundred million or 120 million at the time. And so, he was doing that plus the tax work. So he kind of already had the framework and the structure, um, but he wanted to build out the wealth management services a little bit more. And so um, that's where we were able to really come in and, and help him do that, along with, of course, us leveraging uh, the tax services and the tax team that he had to really combine and, and provide a comprehensive um, solution for clients. Understood. So that's where I got the 160-ish from from the mm -hmm. intro is your 60, his 100-ish. Correct. At yeah. inception, 160. Fast forward to now, you're up over 500. Okay, cool. So you legit just cold mailed, like cold snail mail. mailed 200 yeah. something firms. And I guess, so obviously it worked out with Tom, but would you say you had 10 conversations, 50 conversations, three conversations? Like 200 you sent out how yeah. many you actually had conversations with roughly yeah there was a ton of outreach i mean i'm not even including um you know as a cpa in marin county in the bay area i have a network of colleagues that are in the tax space and so um and so did my uh business partner richard and so on top of the linkedin messages and and calling our our friends and colleagues and and whatnot um yeah we did the the cold mails the snail mails and <laughs> hit the lottery, if you will. 
That's wild. So you guys, I, you had the conversation with Tom. How long from that conversation roughly to, yep, let's paper up, let's do this? It took probably about a year. Yep. That sounds uh, reasonable and, and uh, as expected, right? You don't mm -hmm. snap your fingers and have it happen. And they were probably uh, cultural uh, considerations, making sure that you guys vibe well and philosophical considerations. So you guys approach planning and tax work in a similar mm -hmm. fashion. And then there's obviously the negotiations back and forth. Um, so as a disclaimer, on the road from 160 million to call it 500 million, mm -hmm. were there any other acquisitions from 2020 to 2024 of any other books of business? No. Okay. Damn. So you guys basically grew by 340 million in three and a half, four years. Uh, yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Just like pause for a second, dude. Like you went from, think about this. You went from 60 million as a firm to 160 to 500 in eight years, roughly. Oh no. Well, so I guess, I guess, um, no, I take that back. You went from 30 million to 500 million in eight years that's that sounds, that sounds about right <laughs> um and okay so from 160 to five was that just simply converting tax clients over and sprinkling i know you and i uh you know in our coaching relationship are focused on uh having a more streamlined process to gather referrals. So I'm sure it wasn't mm -hmm. just referrals, right? Otherwise we wouldn't be working together mm -hmm. um, from 160 to five. So I imagine it was a lot of conversion from tax to financial planning. Am I thinking about that right? So um, actually on the onset, it was more wealth management. Uh, you know, I'll say the wealth management side, if you will, was bringing on more clients and then you know, leveraging the tax services. And then probably after I'd say 12 to 18 months, that's when we saw a lot of the tax clients coming over. Um, but we were also mindful about what we were sending to the tax clients. Cause again, we didn't want to be super pushy. It was more, you know, very gently, like, you know, here's some market market um, trends we're seeing and uh, here's some financial, to financial planning topics to think about. And then, oh, we also offer these services if that's ever of interest. Um, so we did it very gently, if you will. And then over time, um, you know, I think the model is starting to get picked up where you see a lot of these big firms that are acquiring small tax practices to offer the same type of comprehensive service. And so, um, yeah, we did. We have an amazing team, and so we've been we've been blessed. And so. Um, yeah, it's just been an amazing ride, I'd say. I want to try and get even more uh, detailed. So like I've come across firms that they manage a billion, two billion dollars, uh, but they have like one firm that I have in mind um, has like 150 CPAs and their tax business, uh, that side that revenue is way more than the $2 billion that they manage. Like they have like, I forget exactly, but 10 or 12,000 tax clients or something crazy wow. like that. And they've only, when you look at it from a client perspective, they only have like three or 4% penetration from the tax side of the business. Those amount of clients that have started to participate in wealth management. So there's like 90 something percent opportunity to convert clients over to like, they could be, you know, I'm making this up. So I don't know exactly, but they could be like 50 or hundred billion. If they actually had a hundred percent of tax clients move over to wealth management. So if you can try and be specific, what were the materials that you were sent to them? What cadence were they sent? Were the uh, CPAs that they were working with? having individual conversations with the tax clients, making them aware, like what did that 
awareness campaign is what I'd call it. That awareness campaign look like to make these tax clients aware that you guys offer financial planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, obviously uh, as a tax firm, you're doing returns for clients and you'll see 1099s and whatnot um, that come through dividends and interest. So if the amount is big enough, that's where you can probably say, ah, oh, there's probably some, some wealth that's generating these dividends and interest. Uh, that's one area. And so then it's being, you know, mindful of that and just saying, Hey, are you working with somebody currently for financial planning? Um, and they'll say yes or no. And if the answer is yes, then the question would be, follow-up question would be, is, how is your relationship? Like, how would you rate that relationship? And they would say great, or if it was anything other than great, it's, um, well, hey, just, you know, giving you a heads up, we have a, a new team that, that does this as well. Happy to make an introduction if that's of interest, making it very, like, again, very gentle, uh, non-committal. And so a lot of folks started to take that offer up, um, which was fantastic. And then throughout the year, I'd probably say two to four times a year, we'd send out something. Um, it'd be, I'd say more importantly, like it, if there was tax law updates or tax newsletter at the bottom, there would also be, oh, and by the way, we have these financial planning services. And so we were lucky in the sense that, I don't know if you found this with your other, other advisors, but we tend to grow the most when the markets are not doing good. Mm -hmm. That's when people are mo most likely to be open to conversations of. Correct. Yes. Okay. So, okay. So you had. So we had COVID, COVID <laughs> and then Zoom, right? And so those two together, I think silver lining, we were able to talk to a lot more people via Zoom versus traditionally it was in person. Mm. So it allowed, it opened the door for a lot more discussions. People could find us and talk to us much easier. We're in the Bay Area. Traffic's insane. And so it's a lot easier to hop on a Zoom versus I'm going to get in my car, sit in 45 minutes of traffic, and then <laughs> interview this advisor, drive 45 minutes back, more traffic. And so that was also, um, I think, a big factor. So it sounds like you guys were uh, intentional like you were actually making sure to have a campaign around the uh, around creating awareness of this new service offering that that is being provided, or, or I shouldn't even say new because it was there before, but mm -hmm. more so um, uh, rebirthed, if you will. Uh, with yeah, that's a, a good way a, to put it. A new team and in, in in you and and your partner that joined, um, and then and I and I hate giving credit to uh covid uh but it seems like uh with all the bad shit that happened with it um you came out on the other side having maximized uh that opportunity with the adoption of technology and the fact that people are more open to conversations when the market's down and for that Correct. whatever it was 3 4 5 month period when it you know before it rebounded um you guys capitalized on that we did yeah yeah so um, I don't know what it's like across the country, but definitely here in California, there's just not a big supply of CPAs. Really? And so what's happening is there's, there's such a high demand. And what people are looking for is tax planning as well. There's a lot of firms out there that they just don't have the time. And so it's, give me your information. I'm going to pump out your tax return, move to the next client. And so I think that was also a, an opportunity for us as well of, well, hey, we have financial planning. We can do tax planning. Let's let's have a good conversation. And so there's a lot of folks that that's where the conversation started of, hey, do you know any tax preparers? Because I'm not getting any tax planning. And then it's, oh, yes, we have internal, we have an internal tax team that can help. And let's also talk about what else we might, might be able to help you out with. And then help me understand the value prop um, from a financial standpoint, meaning do they automatically, if they work with you on the wealth management side, get the tax planning and prep for no additional cost? Is it a separate cost? Does it depend on what their level of assets are that you're managing? Help us understand sure. kind of the economics uh, hmm. that people go through. Right. Um, so we're at a stage now where we're 
trying to obviously offer a comprehensive service to a select number of, of families. And so the way that we set it up is, you know, if folks invest 1.5 million or more with us, then we include the tax services as part of the engagement. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our ideal clients have that and more. And so it's just another value add that we can provide the clients. Um, they're not only getting, you know, financial planning investments, which is fantastic estate planning, but they're getting the tax preparation. And then more importantly is the coordination between the two teams internally. So I know for a lot of clients, it's a huge convenience not to have to <laughs> worry about 1099s. You know, that's something that we can pull on our end. Um, but just the fact that we're talking to each other, we know uh, the, the situation inside and out. And so we can add a little bit deeper financial planning services. Understood. Yeah. I, are you familiar with um, uh, the SAN platform, S-A-N, with Charles Schwab by chance? Is that the Schwab SAN? Is that the... Uh, it's like the Schwab advisor. The advisor network. Uh, network where it's like a referral platform uh, type <laughs> thing. Yeah, we've been trying to get on. They're in a interesting spot right now. Um, so they obviously acquired TD Ameritrade. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happened was... So they first told us, hey, you need to hit 200 million to get on the Schwab Advisor Network. We hit 200 million, then we reached out and they said, okay, we actually increased it. You need 300. We hit 300. And then they acquired uh, TD. And then we hit, we were hitting, you know, hit 500. And they said, well, we're actually not accepting new advisors because we still need to bring on the TD Advisor Network over to Schwab. Mm. Um, so they're not actually accepting new. <laughs> new advisors on the platform, um, which is frustrating. Um, but we're still trying to talk to local uh, branches, if you will, to see if they can throw our name into the hat. So um, that's, uh, I don't want to say funny because it's probably annoying. Um, so it's, but it's interesting every time you, like they're, they're moving the goalposts on you <laughs> over and over again. Um but what, the reason why I brought that up, so I work with a number of firms uh, that are in the the billions of of AUM, and I've worked mm -hmm. with them for a number of years. And you know, one in particular, they still, even with this pain point that I'm, that I'm about to share, they still bring over over a hundred million dollars a year from Schwab. Mm -hmm. Now it's really, I forget the exact metrics, but it's really like it's. 75 million so to speak because of their revenue right. cut that they get mm -hmm. uh, but still it's 75 million of uh correct uh you know of, of assets that they wouldn't have had otherwise but i'm willing to bet that they would be at two to three hundred million a year if which they don't if they offered tax prep along with financial planning and tax planning Mm -hmm. Um, because oftentimes they get beat out by a competitor because the client likes the fact that they can get their taxes done too. Mm -hmm. And so all that to say, once you get on the platform, you guys are going to clean up, <laughs> you guys are going to clean up. It's not to tease you even more for what you already know. Uh, but once you get on the platform, uh, you guys, I, I think, and, and obviously I have some inside scoop because we've uh, worked together uh, since, mm -hmm. well, I think the beginning of the year or, yeah. uh, or something like that. But I think uh, based on your growth up through this point and what we're working on together, I, I truly believe you'll be close to a billion in the next three to maybe five years. But I think if you buckle down, we're going to have to pivot our uh, sessions to, hiring the the right people to support <laughs> that growth. Um, but yeah, I think you guys are, are cracking a code that a lot of folks have either tried to crack and they haven't, um, or are thinking about cracking and they don't know what that next step is. Mm -hmm. And I think my biggest takeaway from, from this episode and this conversation so far, for those of you who are listening that are considering this is, you can't go out and talk to a couple CPAs and firms and think that that's going to suffice. And if it doesn't be like, Oh, I guess it's not going to work out. Mm -hmm. um, 
Trevor and his partner reached out to 200 tax practices <laughs> and that volume finds helps find a needle in the haystack. And then you realize, damn, we just almost quadrupled in four years. Like that's unheard of growth unless you're acquiring a lot of the practices for 50, hundred million bucks. Um, this was just merging together and putting your heads down and, and working. So I think this is a, a really cool story, man. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I do want to also give credit to Tom. He's been instrumental in our growth and, um, he himself also had a lot of success once we merged of adding more assets too. So it's been mm -hmm. a team effort. Um, the one thing I did want, uh, the listeners to also know about is this piece is critical because you can't just hire a tax firm or buy a tax practice and then you're set. Uh, when I talked to those four CEOs that I mentioned, they all said the same thing, which is the tax process has to be buttoned up because if you mess up on somebody's, somebody's taxes and they have a bad experience on the tax side, you're, you could lose that relationship versus there's, or they, they said, basically there's a higher probability of losing the relationship if the tax process doesn't go well, or this, there's a huge error versus a downturn in the markets. Mm -hmm. And so we've been blessed, like I mentioned, where Tom and the, and the tax team are phenomenal people. They work really hard. And so we have a lot of confidence in them and they, they provide great service. Yeah. I think, uh, the less you drop the ball, regardless of what side of the business, the more sticky the relationships are. Um, but I think, I think wealth management is very relationally based. Mm -hmm. uh, not that tax prep isn't, um, but I don't think it is as much. Meaning, if you drop the ball from a financial planning standpoint on like something small, obviously not like totally effing them over, but like just something right. small, they can get over that. But on the tax side, it's like, all right, I'm just going to get a different CPA next year. You know, um, yeah, I think it's exactly. easier for them to leave. And then if that other CPA also offers financial planning, they're more likely to, you know, move their assets as well. Mm -hmm. So having both hand in hand, I guess kind of what you're saying is you have to be mindful of it because it could in theory be a blessing or a curse, <laughs> you know, if you're right. dropping yeah. the ball. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd say we've definitely picked up a, a handful of families um, from their past experiences with their previous CPAs and advisors. So, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful experience. Love it. Well, Trevor, this has been awesome. I, I do want to pivot. So, uh, for those of you listening, if it happens to be, uh, your first episode listening, one thing that we ask all of our guests is a book that's had an impact on them. And, um, Trevor picked uh, Never Split the Difference, uh, which is a book that I've read, but it was less so, it's by Chris Voss, by the way, um, and it's less so the book he mentioned before we hit record and more so uh, the masterclass that is offered. And uh, Trevor, you was, you went as far as to say, um, which I won't take any offense to uh, since you said it directly to me, which is it's the best <laughs> training you've ever had. <laughs> um, but why... <laughs> I have to bust your chops a little bit. Um, but why is it the uh, best training you've had? Like what were some of the main takeaways that you still um, hold on to today? Yeah. So what I loved about Chris Voss and his methodology is, you know, just as a refresher to folks who haven't seen it, highly recommend it. But, you know, he was an FBI interrogator for, I don't know, 30 plus years. And so his main goal was to get information out of people in a highly emotional state. And so he built this playbook, if you will, and that's what he teaches. And so if you think about it, when you're having discovery calls, you're just talking to folks, that's kind of what you're doing is how do I extract the most amount of data that I can from this person? And more importantly, what are they struggling with? Where can I help add value? And so there's a lot of strategies in there, like mirroring, of course, and you know, repeating the last uh, like two or three words that somebody says in a question mark to get them to explain a little bit more. Um, and it's just, it's been phenomenal. And so a big takeaway that I had is always being aware of asking what and how questions versus why questions. And the main reason for that is some people can get feel 
um, that they might be getting attacked if you're asking the question why versus what and how. Understood. I'm on the website now. Um, am I looking at this right? That the it's like fifteen dollars um, a month. Um, so like one hundred and eighty bucks. I, I'm ex I was expecting this to be like five grand or ten grand. Am I am I looking exactly? At this no, I mean they had this promo because for the for a while it was like the number one selling class on was it Facebook or something. Um, but yeah, it's it's fantastic. Wow. Oh, and look at this. This is badass. They got the URL masterclass.com. So it's incredibly easy to find. Um, but yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's $15 is they say that is like the monthly price, but it's billed annually. So, but still 180 bucks. Um, I'll probably end up, uh, end up scooping that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, cool. So yeah, that's masterclass.com. If you want to check out, uh, that, um, but with that being said, Trevor, if folks want to follow along in uh, your journey and, and growth, or if you'd be okay with it, I mean, you uh, asked for time from some of the top folks uh, way back when, if someone wants to uh, spend a couple minutes with you and, and pick your brain, what's the best way to get in touch? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm in the mind of uh, an abundance mindset, if you will. And so similarly, I'm always happy to chat with folks and you know, I frequently talk with other financial advisors in the area and we share ideas, uh, what's working, what's not working. Um, and so always happy to, to ta talk with anybody who might be interested in, in learning a bit more. Awesome. And, uh, is that best over email, LinkedIn, through your website? Any method works. Cool. Yeah. And best would be email. Of course, uh, LinkedIn's fine. Um, if you can't find me on either, go ahead and check us out on the website. And it's uh, what, just FFG uh, Fiduciary Financial Group. So FFGWealth.com uh, dot, dot is com. the website. Correct. Gotcha. Cool. Well, Trevor, uh, it was a pleasure having you on the show. And uh, the day that we're recording this, I'm going to talk to you in like four days for our coaching session. So uh, we'll blink and uh, see each other again, but appreciate you jumping on. And for everyone listening, uh, thanks for your time and attention as well. Thank you so much, David. Take care.